Good morning. I'm Pastor Daryl Scott of the New Spirit Revival Center Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And as I've grown accustomed to saying, uh, now, more recently, the New Spirit Revival Center Church online. This is the Lord's Day. John said I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Sunday being the Lord's Day. And I have a word for you this morning that I believe will bless you if you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive. You know, there are so many of us going through so many different things especially in these chaotic times that we live in. However, as I'm going to bring up from the message, a lot of what you're going through is simply preparation for a purpose. That after you go through these difficult times and you go through whatever your hindrance or obstacle or struggle is, God is going to manifest the purpose that he has for your life in your life. And you'll look back on what you had to go through and tell yourself it wasn't so bad after all. You know, the Bible says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in you. And there are a number of us going through some present time suffering. We're suffering financially at this present time, socially, relationally, emotionally, uh, mentally at this present time. But it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that God shall reveal in you. It's all preparation for a purpose. I told you guys on last week, I fractured a couple of my ribs, so... I'm not able to engage like I want to engage. I don't have the wind and I don't have, I'm not able to, you know, be, be, be seated and in back and forth like I want to. But I'm maintaining, y'all pray my scrimp, S-C-R-E-N-F. Pray my scrimp in the Lord and I'll be all right. So let's go into this word. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I hope it's a blessing to you. And I'll see you afterwards. Verse 22. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Chapter 37. We went over this chapter in the first service. And Jacob dwelled in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water, and then they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spice, we and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Uh, let's go to uh, 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 verse 26. And Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Chapter 41. Verse 38, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. And according unto my word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of on, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God said, He has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plentiness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Chapter 42, final readings. Verse 6, And Joseph was governor over the land, and he was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Verse 9, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. Father, bless us this morning 
and we thank you in advance for the blessings. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I feel luncheon this morning to target this particular message to those who feel as if you really can't continue much longer if you remain in the current situation that you are presently in, or if this circumstance or situations proceed the way that they have been going or proceed the way they are. Because if the truth be told, amen, and this is something we don't oftentimes think about, but some of you had to overcome a great deal of opposition opposition just to be able to make it here, just to be able to come out on this morning. Some of you experienced emotional opposition. You just, 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 just got up feeling some kind of way. And some of you were opposed psychologically while others of you went through some emotional or some relational drama just to be able to attend service on this morning. Don't shout me down. Others of you just got up and really didn't have any opposition at all, except having to decide what to wear. Your battle was matching colors. Uh, what shoes should I wear, the Jimmy Choo's or the Prada's? Which bag should I carry? Your biggest battle that caused you to go, and you got attacked by the pantyhose demon just when you was about to hit a zoop. What the, what the, the devil is a liar. Your last pair. Now you done got out the fingernail polish. <laughs> got that fingernail polish out and stop that sucker dead in his tracks. And so it, it don't go any, proceed any further. Some of us this morning really had or have no overt external opposition that we had to fight with or wrestle with just to be able to make it to church this morning, just to be able to lift up holy hands and give God praise. And that's all right. Because no apparent opposition is oftentimes our greatest opposition. No obvious fight is oftentimes our greatest fight because the lack of opposition can be detrimental to us because it can cause us to become apathetic or lethargic in our pursuit of the purpose of God for our lives. We'll get complacent and content and satisfied on the level that we're on because things are going smoothly. Come on, say amen to me. And because things are going smoothly and you don't feel challenged, there's no reason to try to excel past where you are. A lack of opposition can lead to a lack of desperation. Now, come on, talk back to me, and that's all right. And sometimes in order to access the blessings of God or realize the purpose of God in and for your life, you've got to be a little bit desperate. Amen. You've got to engage in desperation because desperation creates a hunger that cannot be satisfied with anything less than complete fulfillment or complete satisfaction. Can I take my time? And I told y'all I'm tired. I'm trying to catch my sleep back. So I'm actually like, nah, not while I preach. Reminds me of what Muhammad Ali said when he fought uh, George Foreman. He said, I was actually knocked out a couple times on those ropes. He said, but I woke back up again. <laughs> he, said, he said, he knocked me out a couple times. But it was like some three or four second knockouts. I was with the, uh, I was in DC at a round table with the president the other day and they was talking and I sat there and did one of these. I hurt my neck jumping up. <laughs> my dad, my dad. <laughs> Say amen. But it creates a hunger. Desperation does. In, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Numbers, the, God presented, uh, or he prevented the backslidden prophet Balaam from pronouncing a curse upon the nation of Israel. Amen. Although he had attempted to do so several times, God telling Balaam in the 12th verse of the 22nd chapter, he said, you shall not curse this people for they are blessed. In biblical sim, uh, typology, Balaam symbolized the enemy, the devil. Amen. One who was once in the favor of God that was now out of the favor of God who was coming against the people of God. And even as God prevented 
Balaam from cursing Israel then, he prevents the devil from cursing his people now. And even though it may appear that you are in a cursed situation or a bad situation, you have to recognize the fact that appearances are not always relevant. Appearances are not always reliable, amen, because things are not always the way that they appear to be. What's happening is not necessarily what's going on. What's happening was Joseph was in the prison. What's going on was he was on his way to a palace. What's happening was Jesus was on the, on the, uh, uh, on the cross, but what was going on was he was on his way to glory. The Bible says the things that are seen, the things which appear are temporal, which means they are subject to change at any moment. And that then underscores, saints of God, the reality that oftentimes what appears to be a negative or a cursed situation is in actuality an avenue that God is going to use to extract more glory from your life and to use it as a channel to bless you like you've never been blessed before. Because how many know, of you know God can take your calamity or take your struggle or take your issues or perceived opposition and hindrances and turn those things so completely around that what you thought was detrimental was in actuality complemental to your life. Amen. And, and was an avenue that you had to traverse in order to arrive at your place of purpose. I'm going to get you there, I promise. How many of you know good times and happy times and prosperous times? They are indeed wonderful. Amen. But how many of you also know that you enjoy good times better when you've been through bad times? Come on, talk back to me. You appreciate blessed times better when you've been through cursed times. You enjoy prosperity more when you've experienced poverty. And happiness is enjoyed better after a period of sadness. It reminds me of uh, the, the, the hotel magnet. I think it was Conrad Hilton and he and his partner. And when Conrad Hilton was getting towards his death, his partner came to visit him. And he said, Conrad, remember back when we were first starting out and we used to have to jump on the back of trains to get around and we had to, had to him and we were, we were hoboing for a while and we were this, that. Remember those good times? I miss those good times. Conrad looked back and said, yeah, I remember those times, <laughs> but I like these times better. Come on, say amen to me, somebody. Look at that person say, I remember the bad times, but I like the good times better. I remember the broke times, but I like the prosperous times better. Because you appreciate it better when you've been through. But it's a sad, the true fact that God can teach us more through bad times than God is able to teach us through good times. It seems as if we learn more from our defeats and we learn more from our challenges and our trials and failures than we learn from our successes and our victories. Amen. Uh, we can fail at something one time and say, I ain't doing that no more. We can learn immediate lessons. We don't learn financial management in times of prosperity and abundance and increase. We learn financial management in times of decrease and lack when we have to stretch and maneuver and navigate and exercise self-denial in order to make ends meet when we don't have but $20 left till next Friday. You learn financial management when the wolves are at the door, all the children are empty, you're mixing bread with the ground beef, beef Kool-Aid is the drink that you have, you're trying to stretch that meat, you're putting eggs and bread in with the ground beef, trying to stretch it out so you have enough for everybody else, and you pay just enough to keep the utilities on, and, and, and come on, say amen to me. You, 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 you ascertain your, your mileage on your car by how far you can go on E. Be like, you only y'all. Oh, no, I can be able to make it over to 31st and Kinsman on E. I can. Oh, that ain't nothing. I'm just, you're so used to that. You don't measure the needle going right. You measure the needle going left. Oh, man, the red emergency light ain't on yet. I'll be all right. Then once the red emergency light comes on, I still got about 15 miles to go. Come on, talk back to me. That's when you learn. That's when you learn financial management. Sometimes it takes adversity in our lives to build character and to develop wisdom and to prove ourselves in the eyes of the Lord. Talk 
to me, somebody. Because in the natural, see, here's the, here's the conundrum right here. In the natural, amen, there's the lesson first. My grandson had to take his ACT test, but they had time to study the lessons and prepare and even get tutors for the test. In the natural, there's the lesson first, and then there's the test. You study the lesson, you learn the lesson, then you take the test. And the test is on the lesson that you learned. But in God, help me, Holy Ghost, uh, the test always comes first. And then after the test, the lesson is learned. The financial test comes first. Then the lesson is learned. The relational test comes first. Then the lesson is learned. Can I keep on? God knows that if you give him a dime out of every dollar, even during times of financial adversity, he knows that if you give him $10 out of 100 in times of financial adversity, that you will give him 100 out of every 1,000 that he blesses you with when he turns your financial situation around. Because God is aware of the fact that prosperity will not hinder your Christian walk. That you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and wait for him to come on, say amen to me add the things that you need to you. That's why David said, in my prosperity, I will not be moved. He was saying, Lord, when I become prosperous. Now, he said this when he was on the run. He said this when he was hiding in caves. He said this in a state of deprivation, but he looked forward in faith and knew God was going to bless him. He said, Lord, when I become prosperous, I won't be moved. I'm in a bad way right now, but God, I'm believing you to bless me. And when you do bless me, I, I won't drift from God. I won't stray from God. I'll still have the same fervor. I'll still have the same excitement. I'll still have the same zeal for God that I had before I became prosperous. And God also knows in his omniscience that if you can praise him in tough times, if you can praise him when you've been backstabbed and betrayed and forsaken, if you can praise him when you're all alone and depressed and lonely and misunderstood, he knows that when he turns your situation around, you will praise him even all the more. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And how many of you know everybody talks about, I want the anointing of David. I want the anointing of David. Everybody wants the anointing of David. You want the anointing to slay giants. You want the anointing to write psalms and sing psalms. But you don't request the anointing of endurance. You don't want the anointing to duck when a spear is coming your way. You don't want the anointing to hide when you know the enemy is on your tracks. You, want the, you don't want the ability to praise God in times of adversity and challenge and oppression and repression, suppression. Because as much as we love good times, good times do not build faith. Faith is learned in lion's dens. Faith is learned in fiery furnaces. Faith is learned in a knock down, no holes barred fight, a fight with the devil. And it causes you, that your faith causes you to hold on to God in spite of your circumstance and in spite of the situation. And say like Job said, though he slay me, yet when I trust him all the days of my appointed time, all the days of this test of trial, I'm going to wait on God until my chance comes. Some of y'all been waiting on God and it seems like you've been waiting for a mighty long time. If I'm talking to you talk back to me but you can rest assured in your faith that God is not a forgetful God. The Bible says he never slumbers or sleeps and when your appointed time comes when the time of your test is over your change is going to come but until it does just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord because they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Look at that person next to you and tell them, say God hasn't forgotten you. He's aware of your circumstance and your problem and your struggle and he's watching over you and when you discipline yourself to sense his presence and fellowship with him despite your situation, God will take your situation, turn it around and bring you out with a strong and mighty hand Somebody shout hallelujah. And in, in considering the life of Joseph in the text that we read, we see his situation was a challenging situation if there ever was one. Hated by his family. When I get to yours, just shout amen. 
hated by his family, betrayed by his brothers. He's alone. He's afraid. He's persecuted. He's perplexed and written off. If anybody's life seemed challenging or any situation has seemed, uh, that seemed negative, if anybody had a cause to be bitter, it was him. But through it all, he trusted God and held on to God and relied on God. And when this appointed time came and when the time for his change came, God took him out of his dungeon and placed him on a throne. And some of you are in a dungeon right now. The dungeon was the lowest part of the prison, amen. But God is using this time to prepare your throne. Somebody say, I received that. And just like Joseph's gift made room for him, God is going to allow your gifts to make room for you. Look at that person next to you, touch them and tell them and help me preach because I'm tired. Say, you might be down right now, but as long as you've got God, you're never out. As long as you've got God, come on, look at him and tell him, say, as long as you've got God, you still got a chance as long as you got God you can win your battle as long as you got God you can get your breakthrough as long as you got God amen no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper think about this now in examining and scrutinizing investigating the life of Joseph you see that his life was was challenged Amen. From the, the devil contested his, his, his birth from the very beginning. His mother was barren. We read it in the 30th chapter, the first verse. Rachel was barren. And she helplessly watched her sister bear child after child. She come in, I'm pregnant. Okay. I'm pregnant again. Okay. Ooh, I'm pregnant again. All right. I'm pregnant again. This one right here. <laughs> the sister that wasn't supposed to even be in the marriage in the first place. The one who got the position through trickery and deception, yet she appeared to be the blessed one while Rachel, who was God's choice, was infertile because the Bible says that the devil had shut up her womb. She's in a state of non-productivity alone and seemingly forgotten by God. See, some of you this morning, you either are or have been in a situation where it seems as if the people around you are producing while your life is barren. Because the enemy will attempt to close you up and stifle you to hinder or suppress your productivity because he knows that there is a promise and a purpose and a potential inside of you that is greater than all of the conceptions of somebody else. And so he wants to close you up and stop you from producing because he doesn't want what you possess on the inside. He doesn't want the potential you carry on the inside to manifest on the outside. He doesn't want what you can conceive to be birthed. Say amen. And so when we ponder upon the dynamics of Rachel and Leah, we see rivalry and conflict that extends throughout their lives from the moment Jacob enters into his father's house. Here they are, these two sisters. Now, he, he's supposed to marry the one. He loves Rachel, and he's supposed to marry her. And that night, I guess it was dark in the tent. <laughs> sleeps with, the father pulls her back, slides the sister in there, and he sleeps with her. And didn't stop. Till he woke up and looked. Say Amen. So they vie for Jacob's affection as they endeavor to strengthen their personal positions by providing him with progeny for the future. They're trying to guarantee their position by giving him children. And in spite of all of their differences, Rachel and Leah are actually very similar in that each one constantly measures herself by the other one's relationship with Jacob. And that's a trap a whole lot of women find themselves falling into, measuring themselves by the way a man or their man interacts with other females. They don't want to help me right now. 
He opening doors for the sisters of church and letting the door slam in your face. He missed a nice guy over here. He, you go to his job and you don't recognize this Negro. He's just so nice and so charming and so, so gentlemanly at work, but he come home and act like a pig. Come on, somebody talk back to me. They're measuring, Rachel is getting her self-esteem by the way Jacob interacts with Leah. Leah is getting her self-esteem by the way Jacob interacts with Rachel. They gain self-esteem from his attention and they lose self-esteem over his lack of attention. Can y'all help me? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Let me tell you something. Who we are should be a reflection of our own individual talents, abilities, or limitations. We should not we should never define ourselves in relation to somebody else. So here's Rachel. She's barren. Rachel is non-productive. And she's experienced the birth of her sister's four sons. And she realizes she hasn't provided Jacob with any children. She becomes envious of her sister to the point that she tells Jacob, give me some kids or else I'm going to die. In spite of her beauty, in spite of her husband's love, in spite of her own individual attributes, whatever gifts, talents, or abilities that she had, all she can see is that her sister is fertile, her sister is productive, and has presented her husband with four sons, and as a result, she feels that her entire relationship with Jacob is in jeopardy. Here she is, insecure, jealous, self-deprecating, and only through bearing children can she feel whole and fulfilled because she can only see herself in light of who her sister is and how her husband feels about her. She's caught up in a battle for her husband's affection with her sister. Some theorize, some theologians have stated her sister was possibly her older twin because her self-esteem was determined not by the way she felt about herself. Her self-esteem was determined by the way somebody else felt about her. But look at somebody and say the devil is a liar. Don't you ever allow anybody other than you to determine the way you feel feel about yourself. The Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, created in his image and after his likeness. Don't you ever give anybody that much power over you that they determine the way that you feel about yourself. Negro, you want to leave? Bye. Let the doorknob hit you and a good Lord split you. I'm going to be all right. You don't want to be a part of me. You don't want to have anything to do with me. I really don't care because I know that I know that I know. Gonna have anybody else dictate, determine how I feel about me? Look at somebody and say the devil is more than a liar. But it says that God remembered Rachel. He remembered her. You might think you're forgotten by God, but touch somebody and say, God has not forgotten you. Uh, God told Moses, he said, tell Israel, I've seen your tears. I've heard your cries. I know your sorrow, and I'm coming to deliver you. And God told me to tell somebody this morning, he's seen your tears when you're all by yourself. He's heard the cry that's come out of your heart. He knows what you're going to, and he is going to deliver you. Shout. It says God remembered her. He remembered his promise. He remembered his purpose. And he remembered the potential that she had inside of her. And the Bible says he hearkened unto her. Which means that while she was going through her barren season, once again, he hearkened unto her while she was going through her non-productive season, while she was enduring the most fruitless time of her life, she kept on praying. <laughs> oh, help me, Holy Ghost. She kept on petitioning God despite her loneliness, despite her barren state, despite her frustration, despite her anguish, despite her tears. She held on to her faith in God. She kept on praying. She kept on believing. She kept on praising. She kept on worshiping. And as a result, God intervened, opened up her womb, a conception occurred and a manifestation came forth. And God said for me to tell somebody, he's remembering you right now. 
hearkening to your prayers and he's about to open some things up that have been closed. He's going to open doors no man can close. He's going to open up some opportunities that's been denied. God said the devil's been trying to keep you locked down but he's about to release you into the fullness of your potential and turn your barrenness into a blessing. Shout about it. When her manifestation came, she named him Joseph. First of all, she's glad that she's pregnant. Second of all, she's glad it was a boy. She named him Joseph, which means he will increase. She was prophesying to her situation right there. She said, my blessing is going to increase. Look at somebody and say, I know that's right. Then she said, if you read it, she said, God has taken away my reproach. He's taken away the source of my shame. He's taken away my disgrace. He's taken away my embarrassment. And then he said, she said, he shall add to me another son. She was prophesying to herself. She was saying, I got this blessing, but this ain't all. This ain't all. My blessing is not going to stop now. God is going to keep on blessing me. God is going to continue to bless me. Look at somebody and say, God is going to continue to bless me. Because sometimes, saints of God, you've got to prophesy to yourself. Because can't nobody else, I don't care how anointed they are, can't nobody else speak to your situation like you can. You've got to tell yourself, God is going to bless me. God is going to increase me. God is going to prosper me. God is going to deliver me. He is going to bring me out. He is going to make a way. He is going to turn it around. This is just a test of going to uh, the last page hasn't been written this last scene hasn't been shown it's gonna turn out fine I am gonna make it I will get the money I am gonna get healed God will send me somebody shout hallelujah Rachel had finally been blessed by God but she didn't stop right there she said, this ain't all. <laughs> Not after all I've been through. <laughs> I didn't go through that one through just to get one. <laughs> I've still got some more blessings coming. God has not finished blessing me yet. I've been waiting for too long. I've cried too many tears. I've taken too much abuse. I've been lonely for too long. I've been depressed for too long. I've been frustrated for too long. I've been in pain for too long. So as good as this blessing is, baby, I still got some more that I'm believing for. Look at somebody and say, God is going to give you so much more than you've been believing for. Shout about it. I'm trying to get there. I got a few more minutes. So here's Joseph. He's oppressed before. He's opposed before he's even born. Devil's trying to keep him from coming out and made his mama bear. Devil didn't want him to be born. And then he didn't have a pleasant childhood. I mean, we first... Read about him. Genesis 30, his mother is, is, is barren, and she finds him. Genesis 33, he's with his mother and father. And they're fleeing from his uncle Esau, who's coming with 400 men to kill his father because he deceived him out of his birthright with the help of Joseph's grandmother. Then in Genesis 34, Joseph's brothers become murderers, mass murderers, because of the rape of his sister Dinah while his mother dies giving birth to his baby brother. So look at his life. His uncle wants to kill his daddy because he stole his inheritance. It was all set up by his grandmother. His sister gets raped. His brothers murder somebody and his mother dies having his baby brother. <laughs> This is not a pleasant childhood. You talk about family drama. You talk about family issues. Come on, say amen to me. He by no means had a perfect childhood. And now his preferred position in his family and his isolation and alienation from his brothers is evident from the outset of his, his, his family in Canaan. It says, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And then it says, watch this, in, in, in Genesis 37, 1, it says, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Then it says, these are the generations of Jacob. 
And you would have expected that when he says, these are the generations of Jacob, that he would have traced his lineage, like Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, who, who was the son of him, who was the son of him. And you thought the lineage was going to be traced. But it says, these are, you know, in chronological order. And then it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Then it says, Joseph. It didn't say Reuben or Simeon or Levi or Gad or Asher, Naphtali, Zebulon, Issachar, Dan. It didn't say any of those guys. These are the generations of Jacob. You think he's going to list all the sons in chronological order. Then it says Joseph. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph. It means the future of the family is now focused on Joseph. Joseph alienates his brothers. He displays leadership qualities while they're out acting a fool, and even at a young age. Uh, then his oldest brother, Reuben, disrespects his father, Jacob. You're talking about some family drama. <laughs> Bet not nobody never say nothing about me <laughs> after all this. Look at somebody and say, me neither. Y'all notice how bad my grammar was on that? Bet not, not better not. Bet not nobody. Double negatives. You ain't supposed to use double negatives if you're going to have proper grammar. Bet not nobody never. Say nothing. I'm alliterative with those ends as well. Bet not nobody never say nothing about me. Come on, say amen to me. You know, you're going to get out of church, you're going to see your friends. How was church day? It was good. What did the preacher preach about? He said, bet not nobody never say nothing about me. <laughs> Title of the message, bet not nobody never say nothing. And I said nothing, N-U-T-T-I-N. <laughs> his brother Reuben disrespects his father. What did he do? He slept with his father's concubine. But his father's concubine his, was his mother's handmaid, who was his other brother's mother. When did this mess start? Like, what did it do? Like, one day they walked by, and they made eye contact. Y'all know how that stuff start. Just one look. I mean, what made him sleep with his brother's mama? I mean, Joseph was old. Jacob was old, I mean. <laughs> he did have, you know, like three or four he was trying to maintain at one time. You can't maintain one if you want to know the truth. Say amen to me. Solomon had a thousand, 600 wives, 400 concubines. No wonder he went crazy. <laughs> Come on, say amen to me. He stripped of his coat, which symbolized his birthright. He told them they dream, he had a dream that they were going to be bowing down to him. They took him, stripped him. We ain't bowing down to nothing. Bow down to this. Took him, threw him in. From the moment they saw him coming from a distance. And did you hear what he, did he tell you about this dream? I tell you what, when he get up here, we're going to see what's going to happen to this dream. They were already jealous of him. He makes it worse. They all came to hate him. The anger was so great, the only thought they had towards him was to hurt him and to kill him, cause him pain and suffering to put a stop to his progress and put it into his dreams. He didn't have a perfect childhood. In Genesis 37, 2, it says he was 17 years old when his brothers accosted him. Then it goes on to say in Genesis 41, 46, that he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, which means that he had 13 years of intense pain, 13 years of suffering, 13 years of physical and mental and emotional duress which would equip him to sit on a throne and enjoy a position of headship in the plan and purpose of God. That 13 year trial prepared him for his greatest triumph. Those 13 years of pain prepared him for his purpose. Look at somebody and say whatever you're going to now no matter how bad it might seem you when you come out you will be properly prepared to walk in your purpose. You you might feel despised and rejected. You might be the victim of undeserved malice. It might seem as if the devil has the advantage right now, but I'm going to tell you like the old saints used to say, God is not finished with you yet, and he didn't bring you this far. Keep you, come on, say amen to me, in the situation that you're in.
God knew what he was doing with Joseph. And God knows what he's doing with you. He still has his hands on you. Look at somebody and say, he's still leading, still guiding, still directing, still move, molding, still shaping. And even though it might appear to be hopeless right now, if God has given you a dream, God is going to make sure that that dream is going to manifest in your life. Touch that person next to you and help me preach. Say the devil can try all he wants to, but he can't stop me. Say the judges can try, the critics can try, the gossips can try, the fake news reporters can try, the enemies can try, but they won't be able to stop my dream, won't be able to kill my vision because the same God that was with Joseph is the same God that is with me and just like he brought him out he's gonna bring me out to shout notice something the Bible says and I got about 10 more minutes God has a way of preserving you even though the time of your change hasn't come yet the Bible says in Genesis 39 that whatever Joseph did, God made it to prosper. What do you mean whatever he did? When he was in slavery, God made him the head slave. When he was in prison, God made him the head prisoner. Come on, say amen to me. After this trial was over and the time of his change had come, God had a position of headship waiting for him. God has a position of headship waiting on you this morning when he brings you out of the situation that you are in. You'll be the head and not the tail, above always and not beneath, coming behind and no good thing. No matter what he went through, Joseph continued to trust in the Lord. He depended on the Lord. And God used those 13 years of bad times to prepare him for the good times. Come on, say amen to me. He used those 13 years of bad time to prepare him that would begin in the 14th year, the good times would begin. And God told me to tell somebody, your preparation time is almost over. Your trial is just about over. You know why? You've passed all your tests. And now it's time for the promotion. Not only is God going to bring you out, God is going to reverse your fortune, turn your situation around, but he's got a blessing waiting for you at the conclusion of this matter. And it's going to begin very, very soon. Shout about it. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, say, after all you've been through, you deserve to be blessed anyway. Tell somebody I'm talking about me too. Oh, yeah, after all I've been through, I deserve to be blessed. God said your appointed time is just about here. Do you realize God used the famine to facilitate Joseph's breakthrough and promotion? Says he called a famine upon the whole land. How many of you know God will use hard times to take you up higher? He'll use a famine to cause you to prosper. He'll use a recession to get you a blessing. He'll bring his plans to life, for your life to pass in spite of everything that you've been through. Same in to me. The devil tried to stop the plan. Joseph's brothers tried to stop the plan. The slave traders tried to stop the plan. Potiphar's wife tried to stop the plan. The jailers tried to stop the plan. But when God's got a plan for your life, it don't matter what obstacles or what hindrances or what fake friends. Come on, help me come your way. If God has called you and God has chosen you and God has predestined you for a purpose, it doesn't matter what you're going through at this present time. Somebody say amen. If God has his hand on you, it doesn't matter what you've been through, what you're going through, what you've done, or what you're yet to go through when the time of your change comes. He's going to deliver you with a strong and mighty hand. And you'll realize, he'll cause you to realize that none of the weapons that were formed against you were able to prosper. The hurt was a weapon, the betrayal was a weapon, the lie was a weapon, the divorce was a weapon, the drugs were a weapon, the alcohol was a weapon, the marriage struggles were a weapon, come on say, the loneliness was a weapon, the depression was a weapon, come on talk back to me, there were weapons and the forming of those weapons resulted in a time of bondage and a time of captivity, but come on 
same enemy, but the fact that you're still praising God right now, the fact that you're not hurting anymore, the fact that you're not lonely or depressed or suicidal anymore, the fact that you're happy, the fact that you're sane, the fact that you're celibate, the fact that you're sober, the fact that you're still in church is the evidence that even though the weapon did form, it was not able to prosper. Look at that person next to you and tell them when the time of your change comes, God is going to bring you out with a strong and mighty hand. Look at somebody and say, don't touch that dial. This is only a test. Help me, Holy Ghost. He's going to bring you out in a better place, in a better way, feeling better about yourself, with a better mindset. Better, 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 better. God is going to bring you into something better than you've had in a long, long time. God brought Joseph out and put him over the same ones who placed him into captivity in the first place. Who God, God, watch this. God put him over. The Bible says in the Psalms 119, it talks about Joseph. It said his feet, they hurt with fetters which means they had the chains on his ankles. And you know, when they would chain you up, they wouldn't chain you comfortably. They would stretch you as far as they could and make you as uncomfortable as possible. That was the place of, of his anguish and pain. But God put him over the place of his struggle. God put him in control of the people that bound him up. Come on, say amen to me. And gave him two sons when he came out. You know why? He, the Bible says he blessed Job with a double blessing when he came out. He said in Isaiah that for your shame you shall have double. God will always bless you twice as much. Come on, say a minute. Because you had it twice as hard. He put him over all the people that put him into bondage put him over the jailers, <laughs> put him over the slave masters, <laughs> put him over his brothers, <laughs> put him over that woman that lied on him. <laughs> Come on, talk back to me. He gave him two sons whose names were prophetic in nature. Manasseh, which means God has made me to forget all the pain and all the stuff I had to go through, made me forget the pain of what I had to go through. And his second child, he named Ephraim, which means fruitful. That means he said, God prospered me, increased me in a place of my affliction, in a place of my pain. Amen. And he caused me to forget all of the hurt and pain of my father's house. He mentioned his father's house one last time. He looked back one last time. He reminisced one last time. And then he told himself, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm going to forget all the things that wounded me. I'm going to forget about the hurt and forget the pain, forget the people, forget the family members that hurt me. I'm going to look forward from now on to everything God has in store for me up ahead. Said God, caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction, prospered me. He blessed me, blessed me in front of the jailers, <laughs> blessed me in front of the slave master, blessed me in front of the ones that I prophesied to and the ones that I encouraged that forgot about me when they were all right, when they got a breakthrough. He blessed me in front. Look at somebody and say, when God brings you out of your struggle, he's gonna bless you with a double blessing. First, he's going to cause you to forget your pain. Then he's going to release abundance on you. He's going to heal you emotionally. He's going to repair you internally. He's going to correct all your externals. And then he's going to bless you materially. Somebody shout glory. First, he fixed Joseph on the inside. Then he blessed Joseph on the outside. Look at somebody and say, God is going to fix you on the inside. You know when you know when you're fixed? When it don't hurt no more. When you can look at him and don't feel a thing. When you can think about him and don't feel a thing. When you can keep on keeping on in your life and it doesn't bother you anymore. When you don't care what they do, you don't care who they with, you don't care where they go, you don't know care where they at, you don't wanna hear about them, you don't wanna know about it. All you know is God is blessing me right now. 
shout about it. The Bible says after that, all his brethren had to come and bow down. You know what it was? God made him have to recognize. Look at somebody say, God's going to cause all the ones, the fake friends and the family and enemies and antagonists that try to stifle your vision and steal your dream and come against you. He's going to cause them to have to recognize. They're going to have to acknowledge your success, acknowledge your deliverance, acknowledge your breakthrough, recognize your anointing, and see the fulfillment of your dream. And Joseph recognized in hindsight, and I'm about done. When he looked back over his life, he looked at his brothers, you know, you know what? You know how you plot and you plan and you tell yourself that one of these days I'm gonna get them suckers. You know what I'm saying? And when they all, when finally they were standing before him, he looked at them and was like, you know what? It ain't even worth it. It ain't even worth it. Look at these clowns. Look at these bums. These are the, the jokers that had me crying. These are the ones that had me upset. I was twisted because of them. I was trying to impress them. That's my fault for sharing my dream with some losers in the first place. What did I expect them to do? How did I expect them to act? He said, you know what? You know what he told him? He said, I ain't even mad at you. Because now I realize it wasn't you that put me in this bondage. It wasn't you that did this. It was God all the time. Look at somebody and say, I've had it rough in my life. But now I realize it was God all the time. Joseph, you know what God was saying? I need to get you away from them people anyway. I don't care if they are your brothers. I don't care if it is your family. I don't care how long you've been on. I had to get you away from them anyway. And the only way I could get you away from them was if they turned on you. Because you so loyal and you so loving and you so forgiving and you so compassionate. You to stay with them in spite of their mistreatment. Come on, say amen to me. Look at somebody and say, stay faithful to God. He didn't moan. We don't read about him griping and complaining and moaning about God. It says until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. And God brought him out big time. Touch somebody and say, you're about to be brought out big time. He told me you've been hated long enough. <laughs> you've been in bondage long enough. Broke, busted, and disgusted long enough. You went from one bondage to another. You went from the pit to slavery, from the slavery to the prison, from the prison to the dungeon, from mental captivity and relational captivity. And God said, uh, even though you've been bound up, you notice something, and I'm done for real. I'm going to try to be done. Even though Joseph was in prison, his anointing was still kicking in. He down in prison prophesied. He's down in prison hearing from God. He's down in prison relief. You know what? You tell yourself, man, I'm all messed up. But I'm still anointed. You're still anointed. You're still a worshiper. You're still a praiser. You're still faithful. Money messed up, but you're anointed. <laughs> Relationship issues, but you're anointed. <laughs> Can't keep a car, but you're anointed. <laughs> keep having to move out of your house, but you're anointed. But God is about to bring you out, set you up, and bless you big time. Somebody shout big time. Come on, stand up on your feet. God told me to tell somebody here you're not a failure and you never were. He said, I'm preparing you for success. He's called you, chosen you, anointed and appointed you, and you're not on your way down. You're on your way up. And just because one door closes, that's fine. That means it was time for it to close. Because, but God opens doors that no man can close. And sometimes it's, it's not denial, it's direction. It's time for that door to close because God wants you to engage in some new ventures. He wants you to expand your thinking. Look at somebody next to you and say before I stop, say, I'm being prepared for my purpose. What I went through, it wasn't separation, it was preparation. 
Because as long as I was linked up or connected to this person or that person, or I was in this relationship or that relationship, I could never be who God wanted me to be. I could never do what God wanted me to do. Come on, say amen to me. Wasn't separation. Wasn't separation. That breakup, it wasn't situa separation. That divorce, it was preparation. Preparation. Your problems are really the preparation for your purpose. But you know what else? You're not going to be preparing forever. <laughs> your preparation season is over. Look at somebody and say, it's over. It's not going to last forever. You're going to come out big time going up higher than you've ever been before. Lift your hands. Father, in the tremendous, magnificent, spectacular, outstanding, amazing, marvelous name of Jesus, whose we are, whom we serve, whom we live, move, and have our being in, we thank you once again, even for allowing us to assemble together one with another to partake of your holy word and your holy sanctuary on this morning. Now, Lord, I pray special blessings increased blessings, double blessings upon everyone in attendance on this morning. I pray that you bring them out of their individual adverse circumstances and situations with a strong and mighty hand. Amen. Reverse their fortune, oh Lord. Deliver them from captivity and bondage. Amen. And bless them with the fulfillment of their dream, with the manifestation of their vision, with the reaching of their goals, Bless them, O oh Lord, with the desires of their heart as a result of the delight that they have in you. And we're careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise in advance for everything we're expecting you to do. I pray that you heal broken hearts, that you soothe hurt feelings, that whatever the pain and the wounds that they've experienced, O oh Lord, I pray that you cause their suffering to be alleviated that you minister grace to them, pour in oil and wine. Cause them, O oh Lord, to have a, a greater level of esteem for themselves. Increase, increase their feelings that they have about themselves. Let them know they're fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous works and wonders, created in your image and after your likeness. And that there's nothing that they cannot receive if they just believe. And we thank you in advance for every answered prayer, every removed burden, every destroyed yoke. We thank you for it and give you praise in Jesus' name. Shout amen. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory. Now clap your hands one more time. Open up your mouth and give God. All right, I pray that message blessed you. God said, amen, you're being prepared for your purpose. He's not going to use this time to take you lower. He's going to use this time to take you higher. You stay faithful to God, and he's going to bring you out with a strong and mighty hand and use you greater than you've ever been used before. You're being prepared for your purpose, amen. I, you know, once again, some of us are going through some rough times. Some of us are going through some challenging times. We have a lot of adversity. We've had losses. We've had setback. We've had grief to overcome, heartbreak, heartache in our lives. But God is using all that to prepare you for your purpose. He's working it all together for the good. Working it all together. He's working the good and the bad, the negative and the positive, the hardship, the adversity, the struggle. He's working it all together for your good, preparing you for your purpose. And he's going to bring you out with a strong and mighty hand, take you somewhere you never dreamed you would go if you just hold on to your faith in him. So once again, I pray that message was a blessing to you and that you received edification, exhortation, and comfort in, by, and through it. Listen, let's take this time right now and bless the Lord in a different way through the giving of our material gifts. You know, the key to being used by God at the end of your trial and the key to maintaining during your time of trial is to hold on to your faith in God and your faithfulness. Faithfulness is not only a matter of being, it's also a matter of doing. 
It's not simply enough to say, I believe God and I'm being faithful to God internally without manifesting or demonstrating their faithfulness externally. We have to be faithful in our prayers. We have to be faithful and diligent in our reading of the word of God, our study of the word of God, and in the paying of our tithes for the work of God. So I want you to go to Givelify.com right now, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, and pay your tithe to New Spirit Revival Center. Pay a tithe. The tithe, the Bible says, is the tenth. It is holy unto the Lord. The Lord said, if you bring the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be spiritual food, spiritual meat in his house for his people, that he'll open up heaven's windows and pour you out a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. The Bible is very explicit in detailing the fact that God wants his people to be generous. He says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. He that waters shall himself be watered. They that sow in hard times shall reap, amen, with joy. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will cause men to give into your bosom. The Bible says that God ministers seed to the sower and multiplies the seed after it's sown and causes increase to come into our lives. The Bible goes on to say in the seventh chapter of the book of Hebrews that when we pay our tithes here on earth, God receives them in heaven as a witness to the faith that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So pay your tithe. It's an evidence. It's a demonstration of your faith in God, your commitment to God, and your love for God. My tithe says, I believe God. My tithe says, I believe in God. My tithe says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. My tithe says, when I pay my tithe, it's a physical demonstration, an outward external demonstration of the fact that I believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he's coming again. There's so much in it and there's so much to it. It's not something we just do casually or haphazardly. There's a lot of significance to the tithe that we need to embrace. Every Old Testament offering, every Old Testament sacrifice looked forward to or it foreshadowed or symbolized the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the person and works of Jesus Christ on the cross. Every Old Testament sacrifice looked forward to his coming. Every New Testament sacrifice looks back at his coming. We say he came. We say he lived. We say he died. We say he resurrected and that he's coming again when we pay our tithe. So don't take it casually. Don't take it lightly. There's a whole lot to it. And that's why it's so important to God. So pay your tithe. Give the Lord your very best offering. We set as a minimum seed $33, three being the number of resurrection, restoration, and recovery. $33 seed that we're going to sow over and above our tithe. And I want every single one of our viewers, whether you're a member of New Spirit or not, I want you to sow that seed. So you can partake of the blanket anointing that is on this ministry so that the prayers we pray for our saints will extend to you as well. All right? You bring prepared for purpose. Part of your preparation is your faithfulness and your commitment in tithing. The Bible says that Isaac sold in the midst of a famine and received in that same year a hundredfold return. Elijah went to the widow in the midst of a famine, in the midst of hard times, and said, listen, you're going to be able to do whatever it is you want to do, but first, so into the move of God. And so this is a move of God. It's been a move of God from its inception, and it continues to be a move of God. And when you sow into it, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed. You sow in the New Spirit Revival Center. You pay tithe to New Spirit Revival Center. You give offerings to New Spirit Revival Center. There will be a blessing that manifests in your life as a result. I guarantee that. All right. Listen, once again, I can't sit here too much long. I'm about reaching my limit now because I told y'all I cracked a couple of my ribs, I fractured a couple of my ribs. People tell me it's going to take a while to heal. I think my healing process is going pretty good. I ice it down every day and different things like that. And I'm not one to take a lot of pills. So I take uh, I take the pain pills as needed to, to when it gets a little bit out of hand. Okay, once again, I pray that message blessed you. And I pray that God blesses you exceeding and abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to his power at work on your behalf during these turbulent, chaotic, unstable times. And I pray for you. I pray that God blesses your family and that he blesses you. I also pray that God blesses and keeps this nation, keep us safe from any hurt, harm, or danger. 
Okay, Snacks, you know, I was going to try to do some afterglow today, but I'm telling you, I don't want to be in a lot of discomfort while we sit there moving around and different things like that. So we'll see you guys very, very soon in person. We're going to open up the church back, uh, at least for a service. You know, we're trying to play it by ear. From what I understand, there's been a huge surge this past week. And I get reports every day of people that I know that have contracted uh, the COVID-19. And I don't want to put any of you at risk. And I don't, I don't want to put myself at risk either, but I don't want to put any of you at risk. And if it takes us, amen, uh, having to be closed for a little while longer, and, you know, we're, we're, we're disinfecting and sterilizing the sanctuary uh, before we go back in each and every time when we go in and come out. But if it just takes an, an extra measure, uh, and we have faith in God. Don't be acting like, oh, they don't have no faith. No, we have faith in God. But an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So as long as we can communicate like this, we'll be all right. And we'll be back in the sanctuary very soon. But continue to pray. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. If we do this right, God will bless each and every one of us. All right. See y'all uh, this week. <laughs> God bless you.